So let's get into the business side of marketing, right? These days, performance marketing has become the buzzword, especially uh, we are noticing it's been frequently used in shows like Shark Tank India, which has educated the whole audience, even startups, where they are aggressively getting into it to get the leads or to get orders and everything. However, when it comes to real estate, performance marketing entry was quite late in this industry. So could you tell us what were the factors that delayed adopting performance marketing where it was one of the tool which could, which could get you maximum leads, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, today, the way performance marketing works, in spite of the fact that our CPLs are still the highest in the, in the, in the whole universe of CPLs, because we are what four-digit CPLs for most projects. So uh, I think, and it might be a little bit universal to all adaptation of most technology into real estate, right? Number one, uh, and it's because we are so comfortable, right? We're in a comfort zone. Yeah. Print advertising cost us this much. It did this much. Everybody was okay with taking the jackets, and because those those flashy ads, irrespective of working or not working, still was a huge ego massage for a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? The, the hundreds of holdings, right? The the little quirky radio jingle, if you had to, or yeah. or something interesting that you may have done on television. Or in theaters, that 30-second slide that you might have taken in the theater with the brand endorser or the celebrity or whatever you did. So we all got so used to that comfort zone. So to be able to, to get collectively, right? You're not just a team, right? You're an organization. And, and there are other people that play parts to every decision as well. So you have the CFO who's saying, okay, you can only spend so much or whatever. And then you have the promoter. And all of you need to get together to make that, to deal with change management, yeah. right? And some people can deal with change management sooner some people can't mm. so number one it was comfort zone and moving out of a comfort zone mm. second is change management third is i i think real estate up to maybe seven ten years ago wasn't comfortable getting talent from other industries right so we were not paying a lot of uh, attention to best practices mm. right um, and if you're not paying attention to best practices around you it's it's that much more difficult to change, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I think between these three four things, it's it's maybe the larger part of the reasons as to why people didn't or why organizations didn't want to go into into performance marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, there could be other reasons as well, mm -hmm. which uh, is better left unsaid on camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, Dhruva, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm noticing a pattern here in real estate. If any other builder is doing the campaign or the hoarding, the other builder is doing it. So, does it go same for the performance marketing? Till then, no one was starting, no one was touching upon it. Till some few started and everyone was like, oh, they're getting leads out of it. Let's start with that. So, I think there were certain developers which were early adopters, mm -hmm. certain which, which followed. And it, it, I mean, uh, real estate has been uh, like that. So uh, I remember we started off the performance marketing uh, in 2000, uh, I think 12, uh, 13 kind of a thing with, with much more vigor and seriousness. But what is more important is, is how did we use it and what has been the learning from and then the actual performance marketing was adapted. So for example, if you look at in 2013, we brought out a campaign. And we were very happy because we gave a target to our agency to do a performance marketing and they gave us 10 times or 12 times more leads. Mm. Yeah? And we did not know the difference between lead and qualified lead at that point in time. Mm. Okay. Yeah? Okay. So whilst we got a whole lot of leads and people took a serious note of that, saying that how could you generate like lakhs of leads, I'm not joking, lakhs of leads from a campaign and uh, we were all happy with that. And then when we went back into trying to qualify, it just came down to probably 2%, you know, or even less, yes, much, much lesser than that, which could be worked. Mm. Then we learned that how could, so I, I think for a real estate industry per se, the learning curves have been slightly more stretched. Mm. Yeah, We may have been a little late in adapting. But I think once we have been able to, you know, reach a certain, the adaptations have been in multifold and has really brought in a whole lot more 
in doing uh, our business. So, like I uh, mentioned, once we learned that the qualified leads have, we started putting up the matrix. Mm. Then we realized that there is a matrix that needs to be brought in to ensure that my performance marketing is not just about lead gen, but into how does it convert into a sale at the end of the yeah. day, yeah. right? It's not just about carpet bombing, which was, you know, like the practice uh, in earlier days in terms of the reach. So, Badega, it, it, that doesn't give. And that's that's where we started optimizing and we started learning a whole lot of things. And then we looked at, even from a, a, a CRM package perspective in terms of bringing in uh, things like Salesforce into the fold. So we adopted Salesforce and we saw that there is more advantage in terms of if I can route it through and create that database and then you know work around that. But yes, it has taken some time for all of us to, and the learning curve has been a little longish from an industry perspective. And post-COVID, I'm seeing this new trend also where there are two things which I'm going to speak about, one each, data analytics and mandate business. So data analytics, uh, suddenly after post-COVID, everyone is saying we are relying on data. Data is very important. We are using the data. It's helping us and everything. We had seen before COVID only one or two companies. Now there are so many companies in data analytics. Would you agree as a marketing department, you heading, does this data help you in your marketing strategies or does it give you a little bit help only? It doesn't create any kind of significance for a marketing. It, it, it helps big time because uh, like I mentioned earlier, today we are optimizing any penny, every penny that we are spending. Every, uh, every piece of budget that, that, that comes our way we are constantly optimizing and that can only happen if we have one good data and then use that data to project out in terms of what we should do with you know and where we should do where we should advertise how much we need to spend in what and what is actually giving us results so i mean at the end of the day there are so much media which is available where you can put money in but if certain thing is not efficient yeah even though for example, like I started off with uh, the performance marketing where we said we generated lakhs of leads. Mm -hmm. There are still mediums which are available where the leads come in, uh, you know, huge quantity. But then if it is not giving us results, it does not give us the matrix that we are looking for in terms of how many side visits happen, how many conversions from there that happen. It just falls. Unless we, uh, you know, we bring in the data analytics to understand that, mm -hmm. it will all be you know, spending a whole lot of resources in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think a lot of us have seen and recognized the importance of that. In fact, we are talking about not just stopping at the performance marketing or just about the data analytics, but we're talking about data intelligence today, mm -hmm. wherein we're looking at how can, can the data, the moment it comes to us as a lead, mm -hmm. can I start even ranking them? Right. So where to spend more money, more time, more resources uh, from every uh, point of view. And since we are generating a whole lot of things, and for example, the, I have a call center which actually dials out every lead which comes in. But there is an efficiency gap between a person who is actually sitting at the call center and a person who is actually sitting and interacting with customer day in, day out in person. Yeah. So can certain good serving media with a higher score can directly be passed on to the person who is far more equipped and far more uh, uh, better skilled in terms of selling so those things are helping and making it much better uh, utilization of the resources that are happening today okay. that's where we see it's extremely important but having said all of this i think the critical part that we are all i mean a lot of us are missing i would say today also which actually even, you know, because I was in banking earlier mm -hmm. and I've seen that happen even in the banking industry is that the data richness mm -hmm. is, I mean, data is very poor today mm -hmm. in real estate per se. Mm -hmm. So unless we make the data rich mm -hmm. with a whole lot of information, this entire effort can go uh, waste mm -hmm. or we may end up spending money into the wrong spaces. So it's very important and critical that we make the data rich. Would you agree to this data is poor in real estate? Hmm. Uh, I won't take a step back and say 
I don't think enough number of people have understood the relevance of data. Mm. And let's leave aside marketing, even at the sales arena, right? I, I think, again, when we talk about comfort zones, I'm going to reiterate it here a little bit. But, and what ha- tends to happen, uh, unless you have a multi-team approach to selling each and every project, right? You have mm. three teams with slightly differing KPIs or KRAs and, you know, uh, and uh, they're all attacking the same sales numbers together. If you have just that one team sitting at the site, mm. <clears throat> they're again in a comfort zone. Marketing will send leads. Yeah. CPs will bring customers, mm. right? Because this, this, you have these two systems continuously working for you, right? Mm. And and whoever else is there, pre-sales, post-sales, all the other guys working there. I'm sitting there mm. in my little cabin or in my swanky sales office, and customers are coming, incoming, incoming. So do I really need to pay attention to where they come from, what do they do in life, how many kids do they have, and all that mm. stuff? So I didn't have the habit. Mm. Not just as an individual now, as a team and as an organization to collect data. So it's a lack of talent? No, it's a lack of discipline. It's a lack of need analysis. The understanding it, the of root the root cause is need analysis, right? Mm. It's like you were mentioning a, a, a little while back, right? Uh, how marketing was looked at a, a decade or so ago. Mm. I mean, I, I remember the people sharing stories of possibly people in the promoter level saying, ah, sales will add release cring. So, so that's where marketing started yeah. from, so to yeah. speak, if you yeah. go back a couple of decades, right? So the, the need analysis for collecting data has never really been pushed at the grassroots level. Yeah. So if, and I, truth be told, there's still a lot of work to be done with need so, analysis. Yeah. There's a lot of comfort with the fact that customer I engage, yeah. they'll keep coming to me. I just have to tell them about my product yeah. and help them take a decision. Yeah. And if If they're not, because... Who's going to collect the data? Right, right. Right. As a marketing funnel, you're getting X, Y, Z from them. But the X, mm. Y, Z is, like you said, it's poor data. There's very yeah. little to it. Mm. Like, can I do better optimization with what I'm collecting through my marketing funnel? No, it's definitely not enough. These guys have to feed a lot of data back. It's And it's not just for attribution, you know, which source in the marketing mm. funnel or which seep. It's not just about mm. that. It's taking this data back, putting it at the top of a marketing funnel and getting though that universe of customers, mm. a similar bunch of those customers, like how we call them lookalike audience in, in, in digital marketing. Mm. I need to get you that lookalike audience if you if you feel that XYZ was right. Mm. But if you're not going to feed data to me so that I can make l- richer, larger mm. data sets, I'm not going to be able to help you. So how much data can you collect? In the marketing funnel, I think that also is a conversation, right? Mm. Uh, you know, privacy laws are kicking in, and all that is kicking in. People mm. are getting more aware of the fact that my I, my apps know me better than my parents know me. Mm. <laughs> you know, people mm. are getting aware of yeah. stuff like that, right? Yeah. So, uh, and and there's education happening to the consumer. So, how much can be collected in the marketing funnel is, is a is a is a nice conversation on its mm. own. And how much are we, do we need continually need to influence need analysis? is also a conversation and a journey on its own. And when you put these two together, you get richer data, you'll see better results. So correct me if I'm wrong, when I'm noticing builders getting mesmerized by mandate business guys, where I could see a pattern, there are three reasons to it. First is cost, because in that particular cost, you're getting a huge team who is managing from your ideation level to the sale level to everything. Second is, of course, uh, it's a seasonal thing when the launch happens, when the pre-launch happens. So it makes sense to outsource it to this particular companies. Third is, of course, having the talent. As they say that there are a lot of band-aid business guys where people are coming from IM, IIT, and builders are quite impressed by that kind of communication and all. Do you see in coming time, and I have asked uh, builders about it, I'll tell their answer to it. But do you see, as a marketing expert, in coming times, more, uh, I would say, dependency will be on marketing uh, mandate business companies and internal companies will get smaller and smaller when it comes to brand companies. See, post-COVID, back in 2021, the key word at the promoter level, uh, unofficially, of course, was outsource. Mm. It, become, it became a little scary, I'll tell you. Uh, I'll be very honest with you. It became a little scary. It's like, outsource what? Sales and marketing? Mm. It's okay, try it. Give it a shot. Why not? You'll come back to us. Yeah. Why? Because there are inherent benefits to having your own team, a dedicated team that understands your culture, your business ethos, etc., etc., and delivers results for you. Mm-hmm. Right? Why did 
post covid why did it become uh, a talk point i think that's because of all the downsizing that unfortunately had to that the yeah. industry had to go through mm -hmm. and 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 that was i think the number one reason you know a lot of people had to downsize uh, and and suddenly now covid's over now we have to start selling where are the people the easier thing what to do was to talk go and talk to some of these esteemed partners who got involved in the mandate business mm. uh cut to 3 years later i think developer the promoter level uh, and i'm not speaking on behalf of them I mean, this is just mm. a fair estimation of uh, opinions and and uh, and sentiments i think the developer is getting ready for the fact that I have to go back to the pre-COVID days and build my own team. Right. That's how this is going to work, mm. right? Um, yes, there's benefits to any of the the type of engagements you can do with a REMA or a mandate, uh, you know, service provider, and there will always be, you know, potential developers in smaller micro markets, in nano markets, in in the far-flung suburbs that will do well by working with a with mandate, but. I don't think the larger, more established, more mature brands will continue to depend on them. Right? It's uh, yes, all that you said. Uh, you know, getting uh, getting intrigued by having maybe better talent in the upper end. Offer mandate business is is impressive. You get to learn when you talk to them. True. Yeah. But at the end of the day, as a promoter, you know your business better than those guys. Yeah. What do you really need is to understand the micro market better before you launch your project. If you completely believe that you understood that micro market and what it can do for you, for your business for the next three to five years, depending depending on the inventory level of it, quantum of inventory of going into that micro market, you can still do it with your own internal teams. So as you rightly pointed, which I also agree. Uh because I've noticed in other industries also, in FMCG and every other industry, where culture and employee, the way they will take your vision, mission, in terms of how they would take it closely, uh, outside company might not. It will be a mere transaction for them. Would you agree with this, that employee internal team will take it more seriously the way a promoter, developer has a vision? But when it comes to mandate business, that might get dissolved somewhere in the communication. Um, well, yes, but you know, let's step back and understand how the man mandate business really come in, came into play. And like uh, CJ mentioned, what we saw during the COVID, obviously, that uh, the, the crunch of uh, you know paying up uh, for for the resources that they did, did want to carry, and mostly what we saw in the mid to the smaller developers mostly than the more established uh, mm -hmm. developer who were able to sustain those kind of uh, you know the the resources that they, that they care, carried but what is uh, very important in this mandate business is to understand that in the mandate business you are rewarding a company only on success right yeah right. so that became very attractive mm. for any of the developers to actually look at it from a model where can i just look at from a if, if somebody succeeds on certain thing, only then I can give a fee. And which may be a slightly higher or a lot higher mm. than my uh, resource cost. Mm. But that is fine because mm. I don't have to set up a whole lot more. And that is where it started working. Uh, well. But yes, the larger, more established developers would, I would believe, would not look at a mandate business uh, from that perspective because the resources are within which can deliver on a whole lot of mm. things from a understanding of the culture brand products that 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 are brought in the spiel the kind of storytelling that they have mm. lived with and can uh, and can talk to the consumers on those plus mm. the entire skill set of even doing any kind of campaigns are sitting within these organizations per se so i don't need another organization to finally give me the same kind of leads because mm. you know i am also doing the same thing and generating this because the uh, the set of population is still limited, mm. right? But yes, for the more medium or the smaller developers, this becomes a big avenue where they can actually channelize their sale directly through through where it's it's completely based on the I mean, uh, on on the performance of the sales that that happens mm. Mm. from that perspective.